Hello, this is the first of two follow-up videos to my original beach robot piece. Um, thank you all for looking at it. In this one, I'm going to take you through the internals of the radio control unit. I've had a few questions about it, uh, both online and from some friends, and I thought some further detail was due, because it is a complex unit. In the second video, I'll step you through an upgrade we did to the robot chassis itself, to remedy some faults and improve performance and features. So without further ado, this red box is the control unit. It talks via a radio circuit, as you can see here, to the beach robot. Um, it has a display, a sunscreen, so you can actually see the display in the bright sunlight. A keypad for communicating uh, specific instructions like directional headings and other things. A joystick. Um, a main power button, and the most important red stop button to avoid hitting somebody or just deciding to make the robot quit doing anything. It also uh, has a connection area here on the bottom side with uh, a battery charging USB port, a programming USB port. Uh, the Teensy has a reset and a program switch on its main card that I've replicated out here. And then we have a battery cutout switch that lets you remove the lithium battery from service um, when you're putting this in long-term storage. The chassis itself, uh, the box is an MDF box that we machined out on a ShopBot um, CNC router. Nothing terribly complicated about that except making the measurements necessary to fit everything in. Now, that took a couple of attempts, as you might imagine. Um, but that's it. After four years of service and a lot of banging around and dropping on garage floors and in the sand uh, and the salt air, they've begun to cause some issues with electrical wiring and internal connections. Um, so it needs some work. The software has changed several times over the years, but the hardware itself has been static. And given I've got to rebuild it, I thought I'd take you through it and show you how it works and give you perhaps some insight into your own projects. Okay, let's get started. Before we go further, let me talk to you about some tangential but important details involved in any project like this. A uh, critical issue is to budget for and factor in the amount of infrastructure that you'll need. Uh, things that are not the direct project itself, but which will be important to you in the future if whatever you're building is to have a usable life beyond just a prototype. What I've got here is a robot test rig that I built to allow me to design and debug all the electronics before I installed them in the chassis. Uh, it's an exact duplicate of the robot uh, in terms of uh, the electronic parts. Uh, it has uh, a GPS over here in the far corner, it's got the CPU card, it's got the display, it's got uh, a Hall Effect sensor simulator, it's got some pots that allow me to simulate the current sensor and the uh, battery life, and LEDs that let me know if the robot's lights are on or the fans are running, um, a compass, the radio itself here, uh, and then down here we've got um, an Adafruit sound card and a, an amplifier and speaker that uh, let me let the robot do some talking. Um, this particular CPU card is the upgraded version that's installed in the robot currently when we did the upgrade last summer. Instead of a Mega 25 or 2680, it's got the uh, Teensy 3.5 running at 168 megahertz, which is uh, hundreds of times faster and more powerful than the, the Arduino version. I won't talk much about the board here, um, but uh, we'll deal with that in the upgraded robot discussion. So I've lost count of how many times I've used this box to translate and isolate a fault of some kind in the robot or in the controller. Uh, for example, communications start being erratic. Uh, is it the controller or the robot unit? or the robot compass readings get very noisy. Why? Uh, well, in one case, a, a motor was throwing off too much electromagnetic interference and interfering with the compass calculations. So it's a lot easier to fix issues sitting at a workbench with a unit that you know works and that isn't dirty or corroded or wet um, 
than it is to do debugging lying on the garage floor with a 250 pound robot propped up on jacks over top of your head. Um, if you have to do that, that's what you have to do. But if you can avoid it, you want to avoid it. So we'll make good use of this box after we take the controller apart and put it back together. And if we can't get the controller to connect to the test rig, we'll know we have a bad wire someplace and we can get back to work. All right, I know the geniuses in the audience out there have already leaped to a new question or a next question after this, um, so I'll answer it. And the answer is yes. If we built a test rig for the robot, did we build one for the controller? And yes, we did. And I actually used the original test rig in the original robot video to allow me uh, at some point in the middle of the video to drive the just newly operational robot out of my garage and before I built the wagon box that sits on top of it. Um, this test rig is a new version in a slightly better box. Um, but again, like the uh, robot chassis test rig, this has all the, uh, the same electronics. It's got a display and a keyboard. Um, it's got the Teensy 3.2 CPU on a card. Um, it's got the joystick, a spark from battery manager, battery charger, and a, a battery over here. It's got a GPS unit, it's got the radio unit, it's got a little amplifier and a speaker that uh, let me send out some noises. And a power switch, stop switch, reset, and program switch connected to the Teensy uh, circuit. So it is this, as I mentioned, com duplicate. And uh, one of the changes that we're going to be making in the rebuild of the controller box is we're going to upgrade the circuit board to a new version that replaces some of these um, screw connector units, which um, are great, but are susceptible to corrosion and also to loosening. We're gonna change it to some JST connectors and other things, you'll see that later on. Um, but once we build a card, we're gonna put it in here, make sure it works. And we're gonna build another card and uh, test that out and put it into the controller itself. And we should be off and running. So yes, I like boxes. They make it very for e easy for me to just close the lid and pack things up at the end of a work session and know where I was, or at least where all the pieces are. Um, and no, I don't build the boxes. I did a few years ago build several, but it's cheaper and easier to just get them on Etsy and the quality that this one, I think, was made in Poland, uh, is very good. So there's that. And the last piece of the uh, critical support infrastructure technology is this unit. This is a mini robot, obviously, with all the same components and equipment as the larger chassis, uh, scaled down, uh, with just a few differences. Obviously, the motor controllers, which are up front here, um, are the same saber tooth units, but they're um, smaller amperage because we've got very little motors. We're also running a 12 volts here, not 24. The actuators underneath, just due to space considerations, are arranged in a side-by-side -side configuration as opposed to on the big robot. They're kind of back-to-back -back as they run the length of the chassis. Um, and this means the motors driving the actuators need to be programmed a little differently. But we handle that in the software, which runs identically um, and has some internal code switches to compile, whether you're compiling for the larger robot or the small prototype. Uh, but the CPU card and the GPS and the compass and the display and everything else is all the same. Again, why, why do this? Why go to the trouble of uh, having yet another thing going on? Um, well, the answer is, if you're trying to build something as large and uh, heavyweight and potentially uh, dangerous as a robot like the main beach robot, uh, it's good to have something smaller to experiment on when you're programming software. Um, a failure that did happen uh, in the motor control software one night, um, we had a bug and it sent the robot flying off at max speed. And uh, it was a whole lot easier to grab this one and pick it up off the floor um, and avoid any uh, damage than it would have been uh, with the real unit. Um, if it went flying across the garage, I can't imagine what would have happened um, because when it runs at top speed, it runs pretty fast. So it's just easier and safer. 
Um, for example, uh, trying to program how to do autonomous actions like drive in a figure eight pattern. This, the, the code got written and debugged on this unit in my den, uh, driving around on the floor, and then we loaded it in the big unit and it worked exactly the same and, and perfectly. Um, or letting my granddaughter try her hand at driving the robot. Um, driving lessons on this small unit were a lot safer and easier. And once she mastered the control of it, uh, having her step up to the big unit was relatively easy. She did, and she was very successful. So that's it for the major pieces of the tech infrastructure. Um, now on to the rebuild.